Hi, my name is Roger Wilson, and I'd like to take this opportunity to be able to share my story, my testimony to you. Um, many may know my story already. If we have traveled and to your church and shared it, um, some may not know it, and some may just know part of it. Um, but I'd like to take this opportunity to share this. I always start with that we serve a God that delivers his children strangely wrapped gifts. Um, and if we're not careful, we'll take, we'll take that gift and we'll shove it right back to the Heavenly Father just because we don't like the way that the gift is wrapped or the package that it come in. Uh, so we have to be careful uh, how we address that gift. Um, and I can testify to that, and you'll see that here in shortly. Um, but before I begin, I was reminded this week of a story that I heard years ago, and I'd like to share that story with you, and I'll do my best to get this story right. Uh, but it was about a father and a son. The mother had died at an early age, and... The dad was doing the best that he could to raise the son as a as a single dad, single parent. Then the dad was a very successful businessman and uh, had a very successful business. And it took a lot of time to for this business to uh, away from his family and uh, and he only had one child and the. And the son felt a little neglected because of the time that it took away, this business took away from the father uh, to, to grow this business. Uh, so the boy felt a little neglect. Uh, so the boy gets a little older and he goes off to college, and uh, as most kids do. And by that senior year, um, they really have been disconnected. So the, by that senior year, something inside that boy's heart wanted to reconnect to his dad. And so the boy started coming home on the weekends and spending time with his dad. And his dad was spending time with him. And they started to reconnect and building that relationship back. And one morning they was went off and walking in the city close to, the, uh, to where they lived. And... They was walking down the down the sidewalk, and right where they were walking at, there was a huge car lot where they was walking by, and it was a car lot that was full of very expensive cars, sports cars, and all. And the boy saw off to the far off to the uh, on the car lot, and he seen this red convertible car. And to his father, he said, "Dad, that's what I want for my graduation present." That particular car, I want that car for my graduation present. To his dad, his dad had so much money, that car wouldn't be a problem. Um, so, got closer to graduation, his graduation, and the boy started dropping hints to everybody that he can get in contact with his dad. You know, your boy really wants that car. His grades are good. He really wants you to reward him with that car. You know, he really liked he, he really likes that car. He really likes that car. And to the dad, the dad has so much money that car wouldn't be a burden to him whatsoever. And the day come to graduation, and the the son graduated, and they go they go back to the man to this guy's house, which was a mansion, the father's, and uh, he goes in and he uh, he invites his son into the study. So they go into the study, and um, and his dad sits down at his desk and invites his son in there, and his son sits across from the desk, and he says, um, Son, I, I got your graduation present, and th there sits in the middle of his desk was a box with a nice wrapping paper with a big, beautiful bow on top of it, and his son's kind of sit back in the chair, lean back in the chair a little bit, and he was a little frustrated, a little anger was built up in him. This didn't look like the gift that he he, he wanted. And his dad kind of 
slid the box over to him and he boy took the box and opened the box up took the lid off of it inside that box was a bible and with his name engraved in it big bold letters and the boy looked down at it and he shoved the cover back on the box and he put the box on the back on the desk and he shoved it back to the to his dad and he said thanks dad exactly what i wanted he says i got a whole life to live maybe one day i'll take and read what that book has to say so the boy stood up rudely stood up started storming out and his dad said wait a minute son wait a minute ain't you gonna take the time to read what i have to say and he says no dad i'm not and he took off and he went upstairs and he got his bags and he packed um packed his bags and he stormed out of his dad's mansion and went off and um got a job used his dad's name to get a job and landed a good job and started getting a better job and a Started, started moving up the ladder and moving up the ladder and uh, started prospering more and more and more, uh, making real good money. Ends up meeting a beautiful lady, ends up getting married, did not invite the father to the wedding. A few, few years later, end up having a child, did not invite the father to, the, to see his grandchild being born. End up having a second child. Did not invite his father to the scene the second child being born. Did not inform the, the, the dad at all that he had a, grand, a granddaughter or grandson. It didn't say which one it was, but it didn't, didn't inform him. And so, but something about that second child. He really wanted to reach out and reconnect and have that relationship, build that relationship back with his father. There was something inside that was just eating him up. So he he started reconnecting, started sending emails and phone calls, and they started communicating back and forth every day. And so 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 they started talking every day, and and so they started planning a trip cross country to go the dad did to come see his family that he's never met before and end up so happened the day that he's supposed to leave to go to come see his family that he's never met before fly out to cross country he had a massive heart attack and died so the boy got news about his dad he was, again, the only child, so his dad left everything to him. So he had to, he had to travel across country to where his, his dad's house was to take care of all the business and all, uh, all the arrangements and stuff like that. And, and the boy with a hole in his heart as he was traveling, uh, called people and helped him pack up some stuff. And the time he got into his dad's mansion, uh, there was people there helping getting ready to pack up stuff and helping him out and the boy walked by walked by his dad's study last place he's seen his dad alive at and he walked into the study and he sat there went over there and sat down in his dad's desk started weeping uh, started crying and and looked up noticed across the Across the way there, the bookshelf was a box with a with a wrapping paper that he noticed and a bow. So he got up and cleared the spot off his dad's desk where paperwork that his dad had been working on a bit for his business, and ends up going to get that box and he sits it down on the desk and ends up opening that box, taking that Bible out. And noticed something that day that he didn't notice didn't notice in the beginning where there was a bookmark. And he flipped he flipped it open. And what was marked where it was marked at was Matthew chapter seven, verse eleven. And it says, You being evil, 
know how to give your children good gifts, how much more your Heavenly Father knows how to give good gifts to you. And that just, something in his heart that just touched him. And when he pulled the Bible to his heart, something happened. A car key fell out. And he looked down, he took that key, and he noticed that car key was the same kind of car that he would want that he wanted for his graduation present. So he runs out to his dad's garage with multiple cars out there, and he ran out there to his dad's garage, and he looked far off into the corner, and there was a car with a cover on it with a bunch of dust on it. And he ran out there, and he took the cover off the car, and sure enough, there's that red convertible that his dad had bought and paid for and had been sitting there all them years waiting for his son. But see, the problem was the boy got exactly what he asked for, but he didn't like the way that it's packaged. He didn't like the way that the wrapping paper, the wrapping paper that it came in. He didn't like the way the box was. There's a lot of, see, there's a lot of us going through stuff in life that God is doing, we've been praying for, for a long time or a short period of time, and God is about to deliver or delivering now or has delivered and we haven't realized it because we didn't like the way that the box that it came in or the way it came. So we took it and we pushed it back to the Heavenly Father. I can relate to that. My story starts here. In 2010, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. My son at the time, at that time, my youngest son Nikki, was they he played football for Cordova High School here in Alabama, and they were in the playoffs. And they and I worked where I worked at. Uh, I was at work and I called my wife and I had a head cold, and it was a Friday night and that game was that Friday night and where they were playing, they were playing at home. And I wanted to go to that, make sure I went that night, and I wanted to feel good, so, and I wasn't feeling good that day. I had a head cold, sneezing, just your regular old summer cold, so, or your winter cold. And I went and got a few shots, steroid shots, and antibiotic, just your normal shots when you go to the after-hour clinics or urgent cares. So I went to the urgent care and got my shots, and I started feeling good. So I went on to the game, um, got got back, came back home. Uh, we went to bed. End up waking up that next morning. I end up waking up deaf, could not hear. And I told my wife, I I I, I can't hear. And so she said she thought might have you need to go back up to the urgent care. You might have a reaction, allergic reaction to one of those medications that they gave you. So I went back to the urgent care to see if I had one of the allergic reaction to the medication, and did not have a rea allergic reaction. And so they examined me, and they first diagnosed me with McNair disease in your ears. And and scheduled me to see an ENT, so specialist. And um, they first thought that's what it was too. Um, done some hearing tests and done your regular visits stuff that you would go and do your examinations and stuff like that. Did not did not find anything that was um, that was strange or anything like that. So. This kept going on, and um, we, some weeks kept going on, and um, went to see another specialist, and they kept referring me to somebody else, and so, ended up doing an MRI and here in Jasper. 
and they end up finding a they end up finding a brain tumor sitting on my sitting on my hearing nerve facial nerve and my balance nerve and because I was noticing my balance was getting off um, and I done lost my hearing anyway on that side and so we went to see a specialist in Birmingham and uh, at St. Vincent Hospital and so <clears throat> we went and seen him and he came out and he came into the room and um uh, said mr wilson he said do you know um i think um now let me just show you he took me outside he went out and he took me to the charts and he says see this spot right here and i said yes sir I already kind of knew what was going on. Me and my wife been on the internet. We've been doing some research. We kind of, we've already cried about it. We've already teared up about it. We already been praying about it. We've already know what the results were going to be. We already knew our options. We already knew if this was it and what we were going to do. We already knew exactly what was going. What what we felt like we were going to do and what we felt like God wanted us to do. We already knew what that package was inside that package. So the doctor said, this is a, this is a, you got a tumor, brain tumor. And I said, yes, sir. I know. He said, you're okay. I said, yes, sir. And I said, what are we going to do about it? And he said, well, you got three options. You can wait, you can do radiation, you can wait, and we can watch it and see if, how fast it grows. Or you can do surgically, you can remove it. I said, well, it don't belong there. God didn't create it, create me with it in there, so let's get it out. And he said, well, I don't recommend that. And I said, I asked him, um, how many has he done? I'm um, not going to get into that. And and um i said I'm, in, I'm at the wrong place uh so me and my wife went home we started asking some questions some friends and stuff like that and reached out to um my local doctor um scott dixon and he referred me to some other people and um and we end up doing some research and go and finding out that the house clinic in los angeles california was the best place to to go uh, we had insurance so we wanted the best of the best that's what we felt like that god would want us to do so that's what we chose to do so uh we sent our mri we called them we sketch we we talked to the to the one of the nurses they said well you send your MRI report out there so we sent our MRI report out there and a few days later she said the doctor would call you so um so end up the doctor end up did calling us we was on our way to another ball game in Winfield Alabama so uh, we were on we was on the interstate out there on I-22 so the doctor called he says Mr. Wilson I said yes sir he said um I got your MRI report. This is Dr. Blakovich in Los Angeles, California. Just want to let you know I do got your MRI report, and do you do know you do got a uh, tumor? I said, yes, sir, I do know that. He said, you okay? I said, yes, sir. He said, I said, when can we get it out? He said, is that what you want to do? Is that your option you want to go with? He said, yes. He said, well, I said, if it was your mother, would you want, what would you do? He said, um, I would remove it. He said, you're healthy now. At that stage, I was, I was a little different. Um, he said, um, you're healthy now. If you was to get in a car accident or something like that, and you got where you couldn't, uh, get to a point where you couldn't get it out, then, then we got trouble. And he said, I said, well, let's do it. And he said, well, I'm excited to meet you. I'm excited to 
do surgery on somebody that it's fine that's that's excited to get it out and i said yes sir my god is good my god is good and i said he's with me everywhere that i go and i know he's going to be with me during this so um i can't go wrong and we've already prayed about this and he said well my scheduling nurse will be giving you a contact in a few days and we'll get up we'll get all this prepped out i said well i appreciate you giving me a call so um we end up going to the ball game end up going back home um so they end up calling me getting me scheduled we end up flying out there uh to los angeles california uh we're gonna be out there for 17 days um uh, gonna be he took so we we had four doctor visits the first the days that we were out there the first time i seen him he said you're gonna see four different doctors so we had four different office visits um so he told me uh, my options were um to kind of go through the top of the head and go down through the skull and get it that way but and save my hearing but it's he couldn't get all of it or he can go around my hearing take my ear kind of take my ear off and go through my middle ear i would lose all take all that middle ear out and grab all of the tumor but i would lose my hearing on my left side um by doing it that way um so i said I, i'm only going to do this one time so let's get all of it if we can so he says that's the way you want to go that's the way we'll do it so we did it that way um so we end up he said you're gonna be in icu probably five to seven days you're gonna be in the hospital um about the same amount of time you're gonna be in a room um therapy i have to work with you learn how to walk again he said you're gonna gonna be like an infant almost you're gonna have to learn how to walk again learn how to crawl again because all these nerves are going to be cut your mind's gonna have to tell you tell your feet to walk left foot right foot scenario you kind of get the picture um i said yes sir and he said but uh don't worry it's gonna happen so it's gonna be nine months before you end up driving because you won't you won't be able your eyesight and stuff like that won't be able to tell what lane you're in you're gonna think people's coming at you when they're not uh, your mind's gonna play tricks on you so i said yes sir so all that was worked out we understood that very clearly uh, took a, about an eight nine, <clears throat> eight or nine hour surgery we um he said i said okay so the morning of the surgery so we go in and the doc, the nurse comes in, preps, gets me prepped up, did my IVs and all that. And she says, do you want something for, um, do you want something um, to calm your nerves down? I said, no, no, ma'am, I'm, I'm fine. She said, I said, why you ask? She said, well, most people that has brain surgery, like you're having, is ha has a, um, is usually having a panic attack or something. I said, no, ma'am. I said, I'm good. I said, my God is good. They must not know my God. I said, he with me where I said, he's going to, he's going to be back there with me. And I said, he's delivered me a strange new wrap gift, but, uh, I tell you that, but he give it to me. And if he's giving it to me, he's going to be there when, when we open it up. So, um, we're good to go and so as uh as we were waiting there i told god i told god i said god and my prayer i told god don't let this trip be about me please don't let it be about me let it be about let it be about uh somebody else if i can help change somebody else's life please let me be, let it be about somebody else I don't want it to be all about me. And so they came and got me. This is in an old, old hospital that you that you would see on TV or something. Real old. Um, 
kind of scary looking. Uh, <laughs> but it was. <laughs> uh, they wheeled me back there, end up doing end up doing surgery. Next thing I know, I woke up and I was in ICU. Uh, the great thing about it is, is um, I was in ICU for only for three days, two and a half days really. Um, on my on my third day, on my third day, during that half a day, um, they put me. I asked them, "Can I go to a regular room?" And they end up putting me in a regular room because I was so alert and so. My vitals and everything was good to go. Um, nobody really had to watch me, and everything was good. So uh, my medications, all that was good. So they end up putting me in the room, and that was on a Friday night. And uh, the only thing I had really was a headache. Um, nothing hurt. Everything was great. They end up putting me in the room. Um, and that was on the that was on the third day. On the fourth day, uh, that morning, the therapist came in and they 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 came in and run the little walker that they were going to work with me on and all that. They put it all in the corners and they everybody came in. The doctor came in and said, "How you doing? Just your regular visit, you know, checking out his." their patients and stuff like that, the nurses in and out, and stuff like that. And uh, about noontime, um, my wife took a nap in one of the little chairs they have right there. And um, <laughs> I said, told myself, I said, I'm going, I'm going to get that little walker. I'm going to see if I can sit up. So I, I took my foot, I took my foot and I kind of slid that walker over there to the bed. And when I slid that walker over to the bed, I grabbed the, I grabbed the handle and I pulled myself up a little bit and I sit up on the edge of the bed. Woo, that was light here. I got my, my, everything started spinning. And I let it see if it stopped. So I sit there and it stopped. It took me a minute, but it stopped. Uh, then I pushed myself up and I got up and sit up, sit up on the side of the bed. And I end up, um, long story short, I end up walking to the door with that walker. Then I end up going with my wife asleep because she would... She would absolutely, she would absolutely just murder me. Uh, um, no, she wouldn't do that. But she, she would get on to me big time because that's not what the doctor said. We're gonna follow the rules. Um, we're gonna follow what the doctor said. But the so I walked, so I opened the door. I walked on my fourth day. Verses 17, I walked for my fourth day. <clears throat> I walked I walked to the nurse's station and walked around the nurse's station, around the loop, and walked back in into my room. And the nurse at the nurse's station said, Has therapy been in there with you? And they did. They brought me the walker. Um so they was in there. I didn't lie, but they was in there, but they didn't work with me. But I didn't lie, they was in there. Um, so about that time as I was sitting down, I laid back down, my wife started waking up. And the nurse came in there and said, did you know your husband just walked around those nurses' station? She said, no, he's been laying there in the bed. And she said, Roger, did you do that? I said, yeah. She said, no, you didn't. Therapy ain't even been in here. She said, ma'am, the nurse said, ma'am, he did. So that's how good God is. That's how good God is. If your faith is in Jesus Christ, and he's, and you trust in him 100%, he can carry you through that valley in life. And that valley was 
in my, right there in front of me at that time. And, and so on my fourth, fifth day, the doctor come in, and at that time, I was sitting up in the bed building I, as a hobby. At that time, in those years, I, was, I built websites as a hobby for churches and local businesses uh, around the Jasper area. And I was building a website for a church up in Holly Pond. And I was building a website, working on one, and he said, what are you doing, Mr. Wilson? And I said, I'm building a website. He said, you're doing what? He said, I, I'm building, I said, I'm building a website. And he said, no, you're not. And he came around there and he looked and she said, yeah, he is. And my wife did. And he said, I said, can I go home? He said, no, you can't go home. He said, but I'll tell you what I do. He said, you're, you're a liability to me. I can't go, you can't be going all the way to Alabama and something was to happen to you. And I can't fly out to Alabama and you can't fly right, right back here to California. He said, you're a liability. I can't do that. It's a high risk. Can't do that. That's a no. He said, but I'll tell you what I do. We put you in a hotel across the room, across the street there with the facility that we have. Um, for our patients, and you can come see me like four times a day. Let me make sure everything's fine. You can hang out. And that fifth day, I walked four laps around the hospital outside. That's how good God is. We talk about God is good all the time. God is good. He is. And, and so, so we walked over there to the hospital, to the, to the, um, got our stuff together and we walked over there to the, to the hotel. We got in our room, stuff like that. And with me, with my big old bandage on the side of my head and all that, my head shaved half of it. They didn't shave all of it. They just shaved half of it. Made you look funny. And so we get, we get. So we get in there, and we go back and forth and see him. And I walk by, I'm walking down the hall, getting, I was exercising, so I was walk, walking, getting myself familiar, walking, 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 training myself. So I was walking down the hall and walked by the break room, and this lady was sitting there just squalling her eyes out at the table. And I said, ma'am, you okay? And she said, no. She said, I'm, my, my husband's having his second tumor removed. And she said, and I don't know what the outcome's going to be. I said, well, God is good. And she looked up at me with tears running down her eyes. And she said, there's no God. I said, ma'am, look at me. She said, I know you look like you're doing real good. And I said, I just had... I said, I just had surgery five days, six days ago, five or six days ago at that time, six days ago, six days ago. And she said, um, she said, really? I said, yeah. I said, but God is good. She said, there's no God. She said, I'm an atheist. We're atheists. And I backed up towards the window and I said, God, I, I've never witnessed to an atheist. I, I, I don't know about this, God. I was saying that to myself. I don't know about this, God. He said, just share what I've just done for you. And how much you love me. So I shared that. And before I left that, and I just shared that. And before I left that room, she said, well, maybe there is a God. I don't know what happened. I don't know the results. All I know, she said, well, maybe there is a God. I don't know what she did or what happened to her husband. I just planted the seed. And maybe somebody else came around and harvested it. 
Maybe he got well. Maybe the tumor came, was great. Maybe she's going around sharing the story. Maybe he is. And maybe he's showing how great God is. This time, maybe he's giving his life to Christ. I don't know. But I tell you, so we flew back and we stayed there in that, we stayed there in the hotel room for like 12 to 14 days, 12 days, something like that. And so we flew back to Alabama. Everything was going great for the first few days. Everything was going great. And I tell you, um, I mean, I was smiling, big, big smile, big as I can smile, ear to ear. Uh, we were children's pastors at that time at Cordova First Baptist Church. Uh, loved, loved our kids. Uh, everything was just going absolutely great. And bam, Satan hit me like a rock. He put a stop to me. I felt like Job. I felt like God said, you could do whatever you want to to him, but don't kill him. You can't kill him. I fell into a coma. Not a coma, but a depression coma. Where I just fell into the bed with a with 24-7 where I didn't care about nobody, didn't care about myself, didn't have feelings for nobody, didn't even have feelings for myself, my family, my wife, nobody. Satan had a stronghold on me. The Bible tells you that. You got to be careful. Got to stay in God's word. He can kill, steal, and destroy. He steal my hope. He st stole my joy. He killed everything that, that I had inside of me. And I fell into a uh, depression that was so real that I would get up on Sunday morning and I would fight it so hard. And I would go to church. I would go to church. And I would shake him off. And I'd go up there in that children's church and I'd preach and I teach the word. And I do our Sunday and our Sunday um Sunday morning lesson for the children's church. And I, we'd worship God. And but as soon as I got home, pulled back in that driveway. Bam, I hit the bed again. Satan just jumped on me. He was scared of me when I was at church. That's the only place that I had relief. He was scared of me. Bam. I tried to say the name of Jesus, and bam, he hit me in the face. <coughs> he hit me in the face. My mother-in-law come by there and pray for me. I didn't care. It was. It, she's a prayer warrior. And it was meaningless. It didn't didn't have any meaning to me. You know, and I tell you, my kids will come by and see me. I love them. I love every one of them. They are my life. But that depression, when you get it, nothing matters. Nothing matters. If you've ever had it, you understand what I'm talking about. If you don't, if you never had it, and you know somebody that's had it, and you don't understand it, it's real. You think it's a put on, or if you think if you think you can snap out of it, you cannot. It is real. It is real. Some people's are different. Mine was different than other people's. And... And one of the biggest side effects of the brain tumor is depression and anxiety and some other things. But it hit me like a ton of bricks. So I started seeing my regular physician. He started helping me, treating me. Um, 
giving me fluids once a week, just about. The biggest thing he ever did for me was he get, came in there with a prescription pad and he wrote on there, gave it to me, and then I opened it up and he said, build me a website. I opened it up, took it home, and I started building my website. And it kept my mind so occupied it was the best it was the best medication that he can ever give me. I don't even know if I've ever told him that, but it was the best medication that he ever gave me. And I built him a website. If it turned out the way he wanted or if it didn't, if he helped me and he knew that. And uh at this time we were, um, the depression was easing off just a little bit, just a little bit as I was, my mind was occupied a little bit. But I would fall right back into it. I'd fall right back into it. I'd fall right back into it as soon as, soon as it was. And one morning, we were sitting there about to go to church on Sunday morning, and I was ironing my clothes. And a song came on. Casting Crown, Praise You. Praise you in a storm. And I was ironing my clothes, and my wife says, What's wrong? Tears flowing down from my eyes. And I said, I'm like this in this stuff. And there's kids that are lost that don't know Jesus yet. And I'm in this depression. And my responsibility to God is to teach them and to lead them to Christ. And as I was ironing, that song was playing, and I backed up against the wall, and I slid down the wall, and I was crying. And as, as I stood back up, that depression was gone as I was singing. Mark Hall, if he knew that, Deliver, that song delivered me. Delivered me out of that depression mode. Out of that, out of that, out of that coma. I still have depression today. I'm on medication today as we speak today of 2022. But I'm on medication. It's treatable. I am on anxiety. It's treatable. I'm on disability. But everything I'm doing is treatable. Uh, but we went into the. I got on fire for God again. I mean, because of what he did, what he did at that moment. And I was excited. I started going around sharing my story, sharing my story, sharing my story, and started having a bunch of headaches and neck pains. And I went to see a doctor over in St. Vincent again, and. This is in 2016 at this time, um, after sharing my story. And went and had another MRI done, and they read my MRI, and God delivered me another strangely wrapped gift. Now, a second brain tumor. It was wrapped around my brain stem. And I asked the doctor at that time, I said, what can we do about it? Because I already know what, if it could be what I was going to do because I already did it. He said, well, it's she said, she, she said it was wrapped around your brain stem. And if we remove it, it'll paralyze you from neck down. And I said, well, we don't want to remove that. So what can we, what can we do about it? Can we shrink it? Can we do anything about it? She said, well, where, where it's at, we can't do anything about it. She said, we can pray about it. And so do, I, I pick up the phone on the way home, call my wife. Don't ever do this if you ever get a brain tumor. Call my wife, told her I had another brain tumor over the phone. Don't never do that. It's not a good idea. Not a good idea. Um, it, what, that's not a good discussion to talk about over the phone. Do that in person, guys. If you ever get something like that, 
ladies, if you ever get something like that. But end up end up going to see probably about six doctors, surgeons to see if I can find somebody. They end up doing their own MRIs and stuff like that, finding somebody, see if they can remove this thing or partially remove it because uh, it was bothering me so bad. End up taking a lipoma out, but could not get this tumor out. Could not get this tumor out. And all we could do is pray about it. So we, the churches that we went out and shared our story about and shared our stories, we went out and uh, people started praying over me, laying hands on me started praying over me. People that knew about it started praying praying for me. Uh, if I was around or not, they would pray for me. We would pray. And do you know, 27 months later, I went to go to, a, I went to a doctor, found a doctor that said that he would attempt it. And... He had, we had this MRI, he said, well, that showed it. He looked at it, and he said, yeah. He said, but I want to do my own MRI. I want, a different, I want a different view. And so he done his own MRI, and he looked at it, and he said, there's no tumor there. So we had an MRI report with a tumor there and one without. One 27 months, one, tw one now. So I'm tumor-free, baby. God has delivered me from a tum from a tumor that was right around my brain stem that that was eating up a vertebrae that I had to have a neck infusion that was eating up a vertebrae uh which I had that neck infusion done but that's how God does he delivers us strangely wrapped gifts and if we're not careful we'll catch ourselves pushing it back to the heavenly father I took that gift the way that he that he, the way he wrapped it. I took the way it just the way it came. And we done something with it. We prayed over it. That's what he wanted. He wants his children to have faith in him. He wants his love to be shown to this world. And we living in a world that is teaching our children that wrong is right, right is wrong. It's teaching us that we can do it ourselves. We can't. Y'all, if you get that gift that's strangely wrapped, Look at Job. Look at the gifts that he got that was strangely wrapped. Look at, look at, just take your Bible, open it up, and look at all the gifts that are in there that people has received that are strangely wrapped, that come to them strangely wrapped, that if they wasn't willing to follow God's will for their lives, what would have happened. And some of them did not. And so you see what happened. But I was willing enough to, to follow God's will in both tumors. Sure, I'm on disability today with some other issues going on. And sure, there's side effects to all this stuff that happened. And it slowed me down way big, big time. And there's some pain and some other stuff and all this and stuff I can't do anymore that I used to do. But I don't have tumors anymore because God delivered me from two of them. If I get one tomorrow, God will deliver me from it somehow. And if he can't, he can't. He won't. It's okay, too. I always tell people, and listen to this very carefully, I'm in a win-win situation. 
Either I'm going to stay here and worship him, or I'm going to go home and I'm going to worship him. Regardless, I'm worshiping my God, my Savior, Jesus Christ. And that should be you too. Love you. Thank you for watching this video. If you ever you need to talk, my name is Roger Wilson. I live in Jasper, Alabama. God bless you.